convene this hearing as we have convened many before to make one of the most difficult decisions we are asked to make. Uh, in the past Assad regime has stockpiled chemical agents, including 
mustard sound and VX gas, and has thousands of munitions capable of delivery. We know that President Bashar al-Assad makes decisions when it comes to the regime's stockpile of chemical agents, and that personnel involved in the program are carefully vetted to ensure loyalty to the regime and the security of the program. We have evidence that chemical weapons have been used on a smaller scale against the opposition on several other occasions in the past year, including in the Damascus summer. That sarin gas has been used on some of those occasions, and that it was not the opposition that used it. We know that chemical weapons personnel from the Syrian Scientific Studies and Research Center, the coordinate to the regime's Ministry of Defense, were operating in the Damascus suburb of Abra from Sunday, August 18th, until early in the morning on Wednesday, August 21st, here, an area the regime uses to mix chemical weapons, including sarin. And human intelligence, as well as signals and geospatial intelligence, have shown regime activity in the preparation of chemicals prior to the attack, including the distribution and use of gas. We have multiple streams of intelligence that show the regime launched a rocket attack against the Damascus suburb in the early hours of August 21st. The satellite operation that the attack were launched from a regime-controlled area and struck neighborhoods where the chemical attack reportedly occurred. Clearly tying the pieces together. That is what we know in terms of who deployed these weapons. More evidence is available. We will be looking at all of the classified information in a closed session of the committee tomorrow that more clearly establishes the use of chemical weapons by the regime, the military responses available to us, and the results we expect from those responses. But as a fact, in my view, there is a preponderance of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Assad forces willfully targeted civilians with chemical weapons. Having said that, at the end of the day, the chemical weapons attack against innocent civilians in Syria it is an indirect attack on America's security with broader implications for the region and the world. If chemical weapons can be used with impunity in violation of the Geneva Protocol crafted by the League of Nations and signed by the United States in 1925, in fact signed by Syria itself in 1968, they can be used without fear of reprisal anywhere, by anyone. And in my view, such cases moral violations of decency demand a clear and unambiguous response. We are at a crossroads moment. A precedent will be set either for the unfettered and unpunished use of chemical weapons, or a precedent will be set for the deterrence of the use of such weapons in the limited use of military force that sends a message that the world will not stand down. We will either send a message to Syria, Iran, North Korea, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, and any other non-state actors the world will not tolerate the senseless use of chemical weapons by anyone, or we will choose to stand silent in the face of horrific human suffering. We need to consider the consequences of not having Our silence would be a message to the Ayatollah that America and the world are not serious about stopping them armed through acquiring nuclear weapons. Israel would no longer believe that we have their back and would be hard pressed to restrain itself. Our silence would embolden Kim Jong un. We have a large chemical weapons cache and we send a message that we are not serious about protecting South Korea and the region from nuclear and chemical weapons. And we hold it as the law and Hamas to redouble their efforts to acquire chemical weapons and in ISIS. Clearly, at the end of the day, our national security is at stake. I want to thank our distinguished witnesses who will present the facts that they know, will evaluate the debate resolution, and at the end of the day, each of us will decide whether to send a message to the world. There are lines we cannot cross to civilize human beings or stand silent and risk youth crisis. Let me say before I turn to Senator Corbett for his opening statement, the President is asking for an authorization for the use of limited force. It is not his intention or ours to involve ourselves fully in serious civil war. What is before us is a request, and I quote, to prevent or deter the use or proliferation of chemical or biological weapons within, to, or from Syria, and to protect the United States and its allies and partners against the threat posed by such weapons. This is not a declaration of war, but a declaration of our values to the world. A declaration that says we are willing to use our military power when necessary against anyone who dares turn such heinous weapons on innocent civilians anywhere in the world. We know the facts. We'll hear the arguments. We will have the debate. And then it will be up to each of us to search our conscience and make a decision on behalf of the American people. I trust that we can achieve that in a bipartisan way. Uh, I have been working with Senator Crocker as, as we move towards the resolution, but I hope to get broad bipartisan support. And before I turn to him, I just want to uh, acknowledge.
Dr. Preston. Uh, we're thrilled to see her here today at Teresa Heinz Carrier joining us for this event today. I'm glad to see you and so well to be here with us. And back to the Senate report. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your comments and uh, the time that we spent together recently. I want to thank our witnesses for being here, not only for their service to our country in their current capacity, but uh, in their service in every way for many, many years. So thank you for being here. Today, you're beginning the formal request of asking each of us to make the most important decision many of us will make during our tenure in the United States Senate. I know that everybody here on the diet and those who are not uh, take that decision very seriously. I've noticed a distinct sense of humility uh, as we've gone about the various questions, conference calls, the earlier meetings we had today, previously this week. And I know that every member here knows that whether they decide to support an authorization for the use of the military force or not, they are making a decision about our country's national interest. And I know that everybody is going to be taking that decision very, very seriously. One of the issues that many members will have is the fact is that should we support an authorization and use of the military force, and I think that everyone here knows that I am very generally inclined to do so and working closely with Senator Menendez for something that will be a starting point for this committee's discussion, and I know each member will have its input and have its uh, imprint on what it is that we end up deciding to vote upon. But one of the problems that members have, I think this hearing and tomorrow's hearing is important to answer, is while we make policy, you implement. And the implementation of this is very, very important. And I think there have been mixed signals about what that implementation actually is going to mean and the effect it's going to have on the country uh, that we're involved in. I want to say that I was just in the region, as I know many people have been, and I am still totally dismayed at the lack of support we are given, given to vetted, moderate opposition. We publicly stated what that support is going to be, even though it's being carried out over way. But it is to some degree humiliating to be in a refugee camp when our policy has been that we are going to train, we're going to equip, we're going to give humanitarian aid to the vetted opposition. And yet when you sit down with <coughs> people are coalescing around like general <coughs> and others, very little of that has occurred. So I know today's focus is going to be largely on the issue of uh, chemical warfare. And I know that the case has to be made, and I know that each of us have had the opportunity to hear that case, to see intelligence, to understand on what basis uh, these claims have been made. And my guess is that most everyone here fully believes that chemical weapons have been used on civilians to a large degree. So I know that case is going to be made to the American people today as you're making it to us. But it's my hope that a big part of what you're going to do here today, I know we talked about this earlier this morning at the White House, but it's to make a case as to why Syria is important to our national interest. Why Syria matters to the region. Why it's important for us uh, to carry out the stated strategy and how we're going to continue to carry out that stated strategy. One of the things that I do not want to see in this authorization is after, if it's authorized, before it takes place, I want to see us, to, I want to see us continue to carry out the strategy that has been stated, and that is building the capacity of the vetted moderate opposition. So I'd like to have you address that. I'd like to have you today also address how this use of military force that strategy, how it's going to affect the region and the action. So I thank you for being here today. I know a big part of what we're discerning today and what we're making decisions on is the credibility of the United States of America. I know that people in the region are watching. I know that we've been hesitant to move on with many of the activities that we've stated we're going to be carrying out. So today I hope that each of you bring clarity to this. I know we're going to talk about chemical warfare, but I hope you'll 
Bill give us even more clarity about our opposition uh, strengthening, about how this is going to affect us overall. And I hope we'll all leave here today with a clear understanding of how this strategy is going to be carried out. I thank you and I look forward to your testimony. Secretary Kerry. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, uh, ranking members of the thank you very, very much for having us here today. We look forward to this opportunity to be able to share with you from the autonomous region uh, with respect to not just this action, but as Senator Worker has inquired appropriately about Syria itself and, and the course of action in the Middle East. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for welcoming the Razor. This is our first public event. We convene with this debate. It's not an exaggeration to say to you, all of my former colleagues, that the world is watching not just to see what we decide, but it's watching to see how we make this decision. Whether in a dangerous world, we can still make our government speak in one voice. They want to know if America will rise to this moment and make a difference. And the question of whether to authorize our nation to take military action is, as you have said, Mr. Chairman, the echo ranking member. This is obviously one of the most important decisions, one of the most important responsibilities of this committee or of any senator in the course of a career. The President the administration appreciate that you have returned quickly to the nation's capital to address it, and you are appropriately beginning a process of focusing great care and great precision, which is the only way to approach the potential use of military power. Uh, Ranking Member Corker, I know that uh, you want to discuss, as you said, why Syria matters to our national security and our strategic interests beyond compelling humanitarian reasons. And I look forward to Secretary Hagel and General Nancy for laying that out here this afternoon. But first, it is important to explain to the American people why we're here. It's important for people who may not have caught every component of the news over the course of the Labor Day weekend to join us, all of us, focusing in what is at stake here. That's why the President of the United States made the decision to get, contrary to what many people thought it was true, of asking the Congress to join in this decision. We are stronger as a nation when we do that. So we're here because against multiple warnings from the President of the United States, from the Congress, from our friends and allies around the world, even from Russia and Iran, the Assad regime, and only, undeniably, the Assad regime, unleashed an outrageous temple attack against the country. We're here because a dictator and his family's personal enterprise, in their lust to hold on to power, were willing to affect the Arab nationalists with the poison to kill innocent mothers and fathers and hundreds of their children, their lives all snuffed out by gas in the early morning of August 21st. Now, some people here and there, amazingly, have questioned the evidence of this assault on consciousness. I repeat here again today that only the most willful desire to avoid reality can assert that this did not occur as described or that the regime did not do it. It did happen, and the Assad regime did it. And I remember a lot. Secretary Hagel remembers a lot. General Dempsey especially remembers a lot. Secretary Hagel and I, and many of you sitting on the dais, remember a lot in a special way because we were here for that vote. We voted. And so we are especially sensitive. Chuck and I, and never again asking any member of Congress who's 
take a vote on all the intelligence. And that is why our intelligence community has scrubbed and re-scrubbed the evidence. We have declassified unprecedented amounts of information. We ask the American people and the rest of the world to judge that information. We can tell you beyond any reasonable doubt that our evidence proved the outside regime prepared for this attack, issued instructions to prepare for this attack, warned its own forces to use gas masks. We have physical evidence of where the rockets came from and when. Not one rocket landed in regime-controlled territory. Not one. All of them landed in opposition-controlled or contested territory. <coughs> we have a map, physical evidence, showing every geographical point of impact. And that is concrete. Within minutes of the attack, 90, I think, to be precise, maybe slightly shorter, the social media exploded with horrific images of the damage that it had caused. Men and women, the elderly and children sprawled on a hospital floor with no wounds, no blood, but all dead. Those scenes of human chaos and desperation were not contrived. They were real. No one could contrive to make a scene. We are certain that none of the opposition has the weapons or capacity to affect the strike of this scale, particularly from the heart of regime territory. Just think about it in logical terms, common sense. With high confidence, our intelligence community tells us that after the strike, the regime issued orders to stop and then fretted openly. We know about the possibility of UN inspectors discovering evidence. So then they began to systematically try to destroy it. Contrary to my discussion with their foreign minister, who said we have nothing to hide, I said if you have nothing to hide, then let the inspectors in today and let it be unrestricted. It wasn't. They didn't. It took four days of shelling before then finally allowed them in under a constrained pre-arranged strike. And we now have learned that the hair and blood sample from the first responders in East Damascus has tested positive for sickness in Sarah. So my colleagues, we know what happened. For all the lawyers, for all the former prosecutors, for all those that sat on a jury, I can tell you that we know these things beyond the reasonable doubt that is the standard by which we send people to jail for the rest of their lives. So we're here because of what happened two weeks ago. But we're also here because of what happened nearly a century ago. In the darkest moments of World War I, and after the horror of gas warfare, when the vast majority of the world came together to declare, in no uncertain terms, that chemical weapons cross the line of conscience and they must be banned from use forever. Over the years that followed, over 180 countries, including Iran, Iraq, and Russia, agreed and they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention. Even countries with whom we agree on little agreed on that conviction. Now, some have tried to suggest that the debate we're having today is about President Obama's red line. I could not more forcefully state that is just plain and simply wrong. This debate is about the world's red line. It's about humanity's red line. And it's a red line that anyone with conscience ought to draw. This debate is also about Congress's own red line. You, the United States Congress, agreed to the Chemical Weapons Convention. You, the United States Congress, passed the Syria Accountability Act, which says Serious chemical weapons are, quote, threaten the security of the Middle East and the national security interests of the United States. You, the Congress, have spoken out about great consequences if Assad, in particular, used chemical weapons. So I say to you, Senator Gordon, that is one of the reasons why Syria is important. 
And as we debate and the world watches and you decide and the world wonders, not whether Assad's regime executed the worst chemical weapons attack in the 21st century. That fact, I think, is now beyond question. The world wonders whether the United States of America will consent to silence the standing aside while this kind of brutality is allowed to happen without consequence. In the nearly 100 years since the first global commitment against chemical weapons, only two pirates dared to cross the world's brightest line. Now, Bashar al-Assad has become the third. And I think all of you know that history holds nothing but infamy to those criminals. And history reserves also very little sympathy for their enablers. So the reality is the gravity of this moment. That is the importance of the decision that this Congress faces and that the world is waiting to learn about in these next days. Now, Ranking Member Corker asked a central question. Why should America care beyond what I just said? It ought to be enough in the judgment of the President and this administration. Well, it is clear that in addition to what I just mentioned about the Syria Accountability Act and the threat to the Middle East, we cannot overlook the impact of chemical weapons, the danger that they pose to a particularly volatile area of the world in which we've been deeply invested for years because we have great friends there, we have allies there, we have deep interests there. Since President Obama's policy is that Assad must go, it is not insignificant that to deprive him of the capacity to use chemical weapons or to degrade the capacity to use those chemical weapons actually deprives him of a legal weapon in this ongoing civil war, and that has an impact. That can help to stabilize the region ultimately. In addition, we have other important strategic national security interests, not just in the prevention of proliferation of chemical weapons, but to avoid the creation of a safe haven in Syria or a base of operations for extremists to use these weapons against our friends. All of us know that the extremes of both sides are there, waiting in the wings, working, pushing, fighting. They'd be desperate to get their hands on these materials. The fact is that if nothing happens to begin to change the equation of the current calculation, that area could become even more so an area of ungoverned space where those extremists threaten to the United States and more immediately if they get their hands on those weapons, allies, friends of ours like Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, or others. Forcing Assad to change his calculation about his ability to act with impunity can contribute to his realization that he cannot gas or shoot his way out of his predicament. And as I think you know, it has been the President's primary goal to achieve a negotiated resolution. But you've got to have parties prepared to negotiate to achieve that. Syria is also important because, quite simply, I, I can't put this to you more, more plainly than to just ask each of you to ask yourself. If you're Assad, or if you're any one of the other justices and the United States steps back from this moment together with our other allies and friends, what is the message? The message is that he has been granted impunity, the freedom to choose to use the weapons again or force us to go through this cycle again with who knows what outcome after once we're doing again. We would have granted him the capacity to use these weapons against more people with greater levels of damage because we would have stood and stepped away. As confidently as we know what happened in Damascus, my friends, on August 21st, we know that Assad would read our stepping away or our silence. 
as an invitation to use those weapons for security. And in creating impunity, we will be creating opportunity. The opportunity for other dictators and or terrorists to pursue their own weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons. I will tell you there are some people who think that the United States Congress doesn't vote for this very limited request the President put before you. Iran is hoping to look the other way. Our inaction would surely give them a permission slip for them to at least misinterpret our intention, if not to put it to the test. Hezbollah is hoping that isolationism will prevail. North Korea is hoping that ambivalence carries today. They are all listening for our sign. And if we don't answer our side today, we will erode the standard that has existed for those hundred years. In fact, we will erode the standard that has protected our own troops in war. And we will invite even more dangerous tests down the road. Our allies and our partners are also counting on us in this situation. The people of Israel, of Jordan, of Turkey, each look next door and they see that they're one stiff breathing away from the potential of being hurt, of their civilian of being killed as a consequence of choices Assad might take in the absence of action. They anxiously await our assurance that our word means something. They await the assurance that if the children lined up in unbloody burial shrouds were their own children, that we would keep the world's promise. That's what they're hoping for. So the authorization that President Obama seeks is definitively in our national security interest. We need to send to Syria to the world to dictators and terrorists and allies to civilians alike the unmistakable message that when the United States of America and the world say never again, we don't mean sometimes, we don't mean somewhere, Never means never. So this is a moment for accountability. Norms and laws that keep the civilized world civil mean nothing if they're not enforced. As Justice Jackson said in his opening argument at the Nuremberg trial, the ultimate step in avoiding periodic wars, which are inevitable in a system of international law, is to make statesmen responsible for the law. If the world's worst despots see that they can plot with impunity prohibitions against the world's worst weapons, then those prohibitions are just pieces of paper. That is what we mean by accountability, and that is what we mean by we cannot be silent. So let me be clear. President Obama is not asking America to go to war. And I say that sitting next to two men, Secretary Hagel and Chairman Dempsey, who know what war is. Senator McCain knows what war is. They know the difference between going to war and what President Obama is requesting now. We all agree there will be no American boots on the ground. No first use. The President has made crystal clear we have no intention of assuming responsibility for serious civil war. He is asking only for the power to make clear, to make certain that the United States means what we say, that the world, when we join together in a multilateral state, mean what we say. He's asking for authorization to degrade and deter Bashar al-Assad's capacity to use chemical weapons. Now, some will undoubtedly ask, and I think appropriately, what about the unintended consequences of action? Some fear of retaliation that leads to a larger conflict. So let me put it bluntly. If Assad is arrogant enough, and I would say foolish enough, to retaliate to the consequences of his own criminal activity, the United States and our allies have ample ways to make him regret that decision without going to war. Even Assad supporters, Russia and Iran, say publicly that the use of chemical weapons is unacceptable. 
And some will also question the extent of our responsibility. To them, I say, when someone kills hundreds of children with a weapon the world has banned, we are all responsible. That is true for custom treaties like the Geneva Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention, and for us, the Syrian Accountability Act. But it's also true because we share a common humanity and a common decency. This is not the time for armchair isolationism. This is not the time to be spectators of slaughter. Neither our country nor our conscience can afford the cost of silence. We have spoken up against unspeakable horror many times in the past. Now we must stand up and act. And we must protect our security, protect our values, and lead the world with conviction that is clear about our responsibility. Thank you. Secretary Kerry, the American people say no to war. We don't want to war. We don't want another war. Ask them, please, to restore order.
asserting that Jane's actions risk eroding the nearly century old international norm against the use of chemical weapons, Secretary Kerry has noted. A norm that has helped protect, helped protect the United States homeland and American forces operating across the globe from those terrible weapons. Weakening this norm would embolden other regimes to require or use chemical weapons. Example, North Korea maintains a massive stockpile of chemical weapons and threatens our treaty ally, the Republic of Korea, and the 28,000 U.S. troops stationed. I've just returned to Asia, where I had a very serious and long conversation with South Korea's defense minister about the threat, the real threat, the North Korea stockpile of chemical weapons and this threat. Our allies throughout the world must be assured that the United States will fulfill its security commitments. Given these threats to our national security, the United States must demonstrate through our actions that the use of chemical weapons is unacceptable. The President has made clear that our military objectives in Syria would be to hold the Assad regime accountable, to brave its ability to carry out these kinds of attacks and deter the regime from further use of chemical weapons. The Department of Defense has developed military options to achieve these objectives. And we have positioned U.S. assets throughout the region to successfully execute this mission. We believe we can achieve them with military action that would be limited in duration and scope. General Dempsey and I have assured the President that U.S. forces will be ready to act whenever the President gives the order. We are also working with our allies and our partners in the Key partners, including France, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and friends in the region have assured us of their strong support of U.S. action. In finding our military objectives, we've made clear that we are not seeking to resolve the underlying conflict in Syria to direct military force. Instead, we are contemplating actions that are tailored to respond to the use of chemical weapons. A political solution created by the Syrian people is the only way to ultimately end the violence in Syria. Secretary Kerry is leading international efforts to help the parties in Syria move toward a negotiated transition. A transition that means a free and inclusive Syria. We're also committed to doing more to assist the Syrian opposition. Assad must be held accountable for using these weapons in defiance of the international community. Having defined America's interests in our military objectives, we also must examine the risks, the consequences of that, as well as the consequences of inaction. There are always risks to taking action. The Assad regime, under increasing pressure by the Syrian opposition, could feel empowered to carry out even more devastating chemical weapons attacks without a response. <coughs> chemical weapons make no distinction between combatants and innocent civilians and inflict the worst kind of indiscriminate suffering that we have recently seen. A refusal to act would undermine the credibility of America's other security commitments including the President's commitment to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. The word of the United States must mean something. It is vital currency in foreign relations and international and allied commitments. Well, sign no first use. Secretary Kerry, Jeff, and myself have served in the military, fought in war, and seen its ugly realities come close, as has already been noted. We understand that the country faces few decisions as great as you can military force. We are not unaware of the cost and gravity of war. But we also understand that America must protect its people and its national interests. That is our highest responsibility. All of us who have the privilege and responsibility of serving this great nation for the American people especially those wearing the uniform of our country. A vigorous debate on how America should respond to this horrific chemical weapons attack is serious. I know 
everyone on this committee agree? It takes the responsibility of office just as seriously as the president and everyone sitting in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Hagel, and I know that General Densi is available to answer questions uh, from the members of the committee. And in that regard, let me uh, start off by uh, urging members tomorrow there will be a intelligence briefing for the committee on both the issues at hand as well as potential military action. So in this segment, we're obviously somewhat constrained about uh, what we might discuss uh, with, with, with greater specificity. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, you uh, made and have made a compelling case, and I think it's important, uh, and I appreciate you reiterating the high degree of confidence uh, that exists in our intelligence assessments. I think those are conditions precedent uh, to be able to move forward. Uh, this weekend, uh, I was at a soccer tournament, and uh, I had a group of moms come up to me and say, Senator, we, we saw our little pictures. They're correct. Can't imagine uh, the devastation those parents must feel about their children. Why us? Why us? And so I ask you, would you tell them that we would be more secure or less secure uh, by the actions that are being considered for which the president has asked for the authorization to do so? Uh, Senator, I would say unequivocally, unequivocally that uh, the President's actions do make us more secure, less likely that us uh, can use these weapons or choose us to use these weapons, and the absence of taking the action the President has asked for will in fact be far more threatening and dangerous than the ultimate of our lives. And do you consider the consequences of inaction greater than the consequences of that. I do. Uh, General Dempsey, what do we envision in broad terms this potential military campaign uh, to be in terms of its effect? What do we expect uh, at the end of any authorized action uh, to see the results look like? What is our expectation? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. The task I've been given is to develop military options to deter those who say change the regime of calculus without the use of chemical and degrade its ability to do so. That is to say, both uh, activities directly related to chemical weapons itself, but also potentially uh, the means of employment and uh, any further than that, I would uh, prefer to speak about in class. I, I understand that. And, let me ask you this. In the process of achieving those two goals that you just outlined, would there not be a collateral uh, consequence to the regime uh, of uh, further degrading its overall capability? Yes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, we received uh, from uh, the administration a proposed uh, resolution for the authorization of force. And uh, of course, uh, that is a, a negotiation between uh, the Congress uh, and the administration. Uh, would you tell us whether you believe that a prohibition for uh, having American groups on the ground, is that something that the administration would accept as part of a resolution? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it would be preferable not to, not because the, the, the <laughs> any intention or any plan or any desire whatsoever to have boots on the ground. I think the President will give you every assurance in the world that I, which is the Secretary of Defense, is determined. But in the event that Syria imploded, for instance, or in the event there was a uh, threat of a chemical weapons cache falling into the of uh, or someone else that is clearly <laughs> of our allies and all of the British and French and others to prevent those weapons of mass destruction falling into the hands of the worst government. I don't want to take off the table an option that might or might not be available to the President of the United States to secure our country. So that's the 